Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Len Waverman. I'm the Dean of the Grid School of Business. Welcome to today's uh, Knowledge Lab webinar hosted by the school. I'm pleased to see that uh, there are almost 200 people registered for today from across Canada, US, UK, and Kenya. Uh, there is an advantage of being online because your scope of your operation increases. Uh, these webinars are in partnership with Raymond James. We thank them for the continued support of the school and the Knowledge Lab series. Uh, our DeGroote uh, faculty, who you're hearing today, alumni and ambassadors, have the depth of research and industry knowledge that we're bringing to you through a variety of ways. One is this Knowledge Lab series today. Uh, others are web articles, webinars, and the no video playlist that we do. And since we do look a lot at disruption at the school, that's one of our key areas, although we never thought we'd be disrupted like this, you know, we thought it would only happen to others. Uh, we have a lot of expertise and industry experience, and that's the role of the business school, is to help our community where you're all dealing with this disruption, and we want to help in any way we can. And therefore, I'm very pleased to announce a, a, a partnership with MyTax. MyTax is a 20-year-old nonprofit in Canada, a research and training program, a starting a new program called ba Business Strategy Internship Program, which will be, allow us to provide you uh, with a student uh, undergrad or uh, MBA for up to four months. Uh, MyTax and, and DeGroote cover 75% of the $10,000 cost. For $2,500, you get a superb student working on a strategic uh, analysis, helping you restore and modify your business operations. And so yesterday, this was available only to SMEs, but as, as of today, it's available to any organization who wants to take part. And we have uh, up to 60 students available for you to do that. So here's how you get onto it. Contact Cynthia Bishop, uh, and uh, it, it'll be an exciting opportunity for our students and for you. I'm also pleased to announce a partnership we have with uh, Hamilton and Burlington Chambers of Commerce, uh, where we have, we've had webinars with them. We have another area where we call it a web portal called Ask an Expert, where you send in a question, an expert of the group will help answer your question. Uh, the web link is there. I'd now like to introduce our two speakers for today. Our main panelist is Dr. Eva Klein, who is a professor in psychiatry, behavioral neurosciences, the faculty of health sciences at McMaster. She teaches in the health science program uh, at the group in the business school, and she also teaches psychiatrists. Uh, she has uh, years of practice also as a coach, uh, and uh, as a uh, participant in, in training and senior levels at a number of firms across Canada, uh, UK, and US. She's also been in hospitals. She's a clinical psychologist. I, and I'm uh, delighted also and fortunate to have her as my wife. So, um, and uh, let me uh, now introduce Vishwanath Baba, known as Baba to all of us who was a professor at the group and a former dean at the group. Uh, he specializes in stress management, development management, management skill development, and management training in the developing world. And his research interests, which are many, uh, he was originally an engineer and was, besides uh, being the dean at the group, was also the uh, director of the engineering management program for five years. His research interests cover management theory, evidence-based management, work attitudes, employee well-being, and I see uh, Baba stress, depression, and burnout. That must be from your time of being a dean. <laughs> well put. So uh, thank you, Baba, for moderating today's session. I turn it over to you. Thank you, Len, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before we get started, um, I would like to uh, welcome Dr. Eva Klein, uh, who is going to share her thoughts and ideas and wisdom with you. And before we get to the uh, substance of these things, 
I'd like to go over a number of housekeeping points. And um, there is going to be a QA and a uh, after Eva had finished her presentation. And so please use the Q&A function on your uh, screen to send us the question, and we will try to answer as many questions as possible. And um, we are going to be recording this session. So um, whatever uh, you say and do is going to be recorded, and we are going to share it with the, the group community. If you um, do not want to be recorded, then uh, you uh, do not participate in this thing. That way, we keep it clear. We do not have the technology to separate those who want to participate and those who do not. So let's keep that in mind. And um, um, at the end of the day, um, if you have um, any questions or, uh, or uh, feedback and so on, contact the marketing and community engagement at the group. Um, so that uh, we know what you are thinking. This is about feedback. We will send you an email to seek your feedback. It's going to take you a couple of minutes, but we would like to know what we are doing well and what we are not so doing well. And that way we'll be on a continuous process of improvement. And uh, without much more, I'm going to invite Dr. Eva Klein. And uh, the way we want to proceed is, you know, we all have questions about remote work, working from home, and, uh, and productivity, and all that sort of thing. So what I'll do is I'll pose a question to Eva, and uh, she will uh, give us a response, and then we'll talk about um, um, what your feelings are about, uh, about this topic through a polling mechanism. Um, Eva, um, many people uh, have been forced to work from home. There are those who uh, have to go to the office, the frontline workers, uh, grocery store people, and so on. But many of us are working from home, and this has forced both individuals and organizations to think differently. So uh, the key ingredient here is productivity, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on, um, on productivity and um, what are the benefits, what are the costs, both to employers and employees under this remote working due to COVID-19? Uh, yeah. Well, uh, thanks, Baba. Now, remote working was already exploding before COVID-19. And I want to share some statistics with you. At the start of 2019, the International Workplace Group, a polling group in the United States, gathered the opinions of more than 15,000 people across 100 countries, and they found that 50% of global employees were working remotely at least 2.5 days a week. In Canada, 43% of professionals say their company has provided options to work at home some of the time, and more than 60% had taken advantage of this option, and that may be some of you. Research conducted before the pandemic found that working from home offers significant effects for both employee and employer. It can bring real upsides in terms of better quality of life and work-life balance. And for employers, it brings increased productivity. Now, that's a big surprise for many employers who often resist employees' requests to stay at home because they're uncertain on how to measure productivity. Uh, I don't know how many of you remember uh, Marisa Meyer, the CEO of Yahoo, uh, who got all remote workers to return to the office. She became one of the most unpopular CEOs in the United States. However, there's a lot of research studies that prove the opposite. I want to cite a very quoted study done in 2015 by Nicholas Bloom, a professor of economics at Stanford University. He was working with a Chinese travel agency and he offered a thousand employees to work remotely, 500 volunteered. And he found to his surprise and to their employer's surprise that their productivity went up to 20% higher. 
it was a win-win. So productivity, in fact, can increase when you're working remotely. I'm sure that many of you are feeling more productive than you usually are, and maybe just a little too productive. But we'll say a little bit about that a little later. Now, employers also embrace work, uh, uh, remote work, because of, think of the cost savings of office space. Uh, personally, I've sold all my commercial real estate stocks. Uh, real estate is going to have a hard time. The, uh, there's another agency, the Global Workplace Analytics Survey that estimates a typical employer can save an average of $11,000 per half time of commuter uh, person per year. Other benefits include increased morale, reduced absenteeism, uh, because it's much easier to stay at home. Uh, you're not as absent when you're staying at home. Reduced employer turnover and reduced health insurance costs. Another great benefit for employers is that remote work allows them to hire top talent without limiting themselves to geographical restrictions. Employers can hire employees who don't want to relocate or who can't afford to re relocate. And employees gain because they have cheaper housing. Statistics show that an average employee gains about $4,000 a year uh, living where they want to. Where I live in Burlington, housing prices have gone up because everybody is leaving Toronto and coming to Burlington. Virtual work is the new normal. Uh, working at home often improves how employer, employees feel about their job. Employees prize greater flexibility in setting their work hours, additional time with family, and reduced distractions. So we'll say a little more about that. Uh, but for example, no one's stepping into your cubicle and saying, hey, I need this, or I need your help right now. So employees enjoy that flexibility. In fact, employees are so keen to work from home that 36% of Canadian employees say they'd be willing to consider a pay cut to be able to work from home. However, there are unsettling, it's not all rosy, there are unsettling side effects for employees. Research shows that work hours often encroach on leisure time. People are busier than ever because there's no clear demarcation of work and home. Some of us are far too productive to our detriment. We can burn out. How many of your companies have policies that respect work-life balance? How many of you get phone calls Sunday night at 10 o'clock or are on the phone at 10 p.m. I know I heard my husband on the phone at 10 p.m. just recently phoning somebody, and I don't think that he's unique. Uh, then there's the area of space. Some people don't have the luxury of a separate office and always feel distracted by a partner or children. People that I've interviewed are working from their bedrooms or shared common rooms, and they're getting noise from their partners, their roommates, and their family. I was just recently chatting with some psychoanalyst colleagues in New York City, and what they were telling me is that the new analyst couch is the toilet. And uh, that's because the washroom is seems to be the only place that people can actually feel totally private and many employees are feeling lonely and isolated it's a paradox you can feel removed from colleagues even though you're drowning in digital messages from them many people find it hard to focus with personal distractions veering themselves away from work uh, now, just I want to go back to this Bloom experiment uh, because it has an interesting sideline because it asked employees to work from home four days a week and come into the office every fifth day. 
and Bloom feels in-person collaboration is necessary for creativity and innovation. And as research has shown that face-to-face -face meetings are essential for developing new ideas and keeping staff motivated and focused. And this is what he says. He says, I fear the collapse in office time. Uh, FaceTime will lead to a slump in innovation. The new ideas we're losing today could show up as fewer new products in 2020 and beyond, lowering long-term growth. So the, uh, the uh, productivity might be there, but are we going to lose on innovation? Now, the element of choice is, uh, is an also an interesting final factor. Uh, of the 1,000 uh, employees offered to jo the choice to work from home, only 500 volunteer. The others wanted to stay in the office. And after nine months of allowing these employees to do their jobs at home, uh, Bloom asked the original volunteers they whether they wanted to keep working remotely or return to the office. Half of them requested to return to the office despite the fact that they had 40 minutes of commute time each way. Now, why is that? The answer is social. They, they feel, they felt uh, isolated, lonely, depressed at home. And he worries that working just from home for some people will build a mental health crisis. We're social animals, even the introverts among us, and I'm not one of them. And we crave interaction and benefit from personal contact. And we can see that uh, we work hasn't gone out of business. People still want to be in these shared places. Uh, uh, an assistant uh, at RJC just recently gave her notice during COVID-19. Uh, and it was strange because you'd think there'd be less pressure on her. But her main motivation to work was social, I suspect. And so she didn't, she didn't want the job anymore. So I'm just going to summarize. To take advantage of the benefits of remote work, you have to consider how to handle children, how to handle space, the issues of privacy and choice, and work leisure boundaries. What can we do to make this process work better? Uh, yeah, you know, uh, Baba, problems with video and so on. And, and also, we are working in teams. You know, nobody is working alone. Although we are sitting in our own remote workplaces, we work as a team as we are doing now. And so. What are your thoughts on how can teams be more successful? Yeah, no, I think we are, I think we are all zoomed out. And uh, then the very irritating things is that sometimes happy hours with friends are also Zoom. And back-to-back -back Zoom calls can be extraordinarily draining. I'm sure that's true for all of you. And one of the reasons that Zoom calls are so difficult and tiring that it violates our normal use of eye gaze. Now, if we were together just chatting with each other, Baba, I'd be looking at you a little bit, maybe not more than three seconds, yeah. and then I'd move away, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but with Zoom, it seems rude not to keep looking at that person. It looks like we're looking at something else. And so we keep looking and actually keeping to look at a person is unsettling. And the other thing that we can't do with Zoom is we can't be in synchrony with each other if, as we could in the same room. Uh, people, when they're together, synchronize their laughter, their facial expressions, their bodily expression. And it's hard when you don't see the person's body and then those little staggering lags in video. Now, I, I invite the audience to say, what do you like better? Do you like Baba's setup or do you like mine where you see half my body? Because it's something for you to think about. What works the best? Because you do have a choice. I purposely put my seat back, knowing that Baba would be quite in front. And it's something for you to think about. 
uh, what what gives you the most um, gives you the most uh, information about a person uh, and we're lucky we haven't had any lags in video the other thing uh, about uh, zoom and video calls is you're also always seeing a constant video of yourself and it breaks down your attention to whomever you're speaking. You might not like, like, I don't love these things here. I'm always criticizing myself when I see myself. So we need to find new ways of behaving when we're using screen. Uh, landscapes, we were talking about landscapes before and we're not gonna show them to you. But landscapes can be rather distracting. Uh, mine is quite distracting. There's a lot going on. And some of the fashion shows that, that now have been going on in models' rooms, people are so curious about where they live, they forget about what they're talking about. Uh, now, what can we do to make Zoom calls less draining? Uh, one of the things I confess I do is during webinars and even during Zoom calls, I get on my treadmill or a stationary bike. At the end of my webinar, I've done about two miles and probably retained even more because I'm alert. On Zoom calls, uh, I think it's best to alert your host that your head may bob a little bit. Uh, I saw the uh, Dean of Engineering talking on one of their meetings uh, and he had taken my suggestion. So there he was on his treadmill at one mile an hour, somewhat bobbing. Uh, the other thing that you can do is sometimes do a regular telephone call. Uh, FaceTime uh, is not always the best, and it's a good idea to warn people if you're going to use FaceTime. Many of us are vain, and we want to feel prepared that we have at least our hair in, in good shape. Uh, now, uh, Baba, you also mentioned what we can do to make virtual meetings more efficient. And maybe I, I, I can chat a little bit about that oh. and, and how we can get increased engagement and productivity. Exactly. Now, th this is a case where best practices are really important. And, that, and we know what best practices are, but for virtual meetings, they're really important. So you have to have a clear agenda that supports the purpose. You have to know why you're in the meeting. You have to have the right people to attend. And then you have to get everyone to participate. Uh, and that's important, so it means calling on people. I certainly know teaching classes, there are certain people that never talk, but with Zoom, I can call upon them to talk uh, much more easily. And what I can also do is warn them in advance that I'm going to be calling upon them. Um, and what I found is that people that are generally very shy and don't talk, if they're given a little warning, all of a sudden love contributing. Uh, it's also important to have good housekeeping, starting and ending on time and having just the right amount of time allocated to what you're doing. And you wanna keep uh, conversations efficient but you also want a free expression of ideas. And then at the conclusion, you've got to have action plans for follow-up. Uh, just a little research here. Uh, research shows that 36% of a manager's time is spent in meetings, and only 39% of these meetings achieve their objectives. And these are pre-COVID-19 rules uh, and one of the reasons that this happens is that there are always difficult conversations to address in meeting. And addressing them effectively is important, is important to make meetings effective. Uh, this often doesn't happen in face-to-face -face meetings, and it happens even less in virtual meetings where trust is lower. Uh, I teach something called uh, Crucial Conversations, and it gives you skills on how to bring up things that people and then you yourself feel uncomfortable bringing up. As we do these group meetings, we also have to uh, 
make sure we have one-on-ones with people because people value one-on-ones and uh, it's a time where you can be much more intimate as well. And I don't have an answer to this. What can we do the, to the water cooler culture? Mm-hmm. How can we create that virtually? Because that's when innovation really happens. Just a chance, hello, I'm chatting with somebody and an idea sparks. Um, uh, Emma, I think yes. uh, we, what you are saying is going to segue us. You are saying, talking about this need to have that human interaction at the water cooler, drop in, and so on, the spontaneity yeah. of, uh, of uh, uh, various things that happen at workplace. Now, we are going to be um, returning to work, at least partially. So this takes us to the next issue, okay? We have all these, we have this longing to be back at work, at least partially. How can we prepare ourselves to return to work in a different format, the new normal, to use your word? Right, right. And I think we are going to be getting back to work. Uh, I think, first of all, I think many executives are going to rethink traveling to meetings and conferences. They... Virtual meetings may not have all the benefits of being face to face, but the savings are going to outweigh the costs so, so much. And I went through some of them, like $11,000 a year per, for a person who only works half the time. Uh, I think some of the, I'd say maybe the statistics I have, and it seems low, seems that 30% of the workforce will be returning to work from home multiple days by the end of 2021. Uh, Some employees will work from home more often, some less. It depends what kind of job you have. Uh, If your job is really based on innovation, then I think you're probably going to want to spend more time in the office. If you're an accountant and a lot of the work that you do is really quite solitary, then working remotely is a, is a great, is, is a great solution. Uh, But one of the biggest holdbacks of remote work, and uh, you mentioned this Baba is trust. Managers simply don't trust their people to work. They're used to managing by counting butts and seats rather than by results. And really, that's not managing. That's babysitting. Uh, it's, but it's very hard to figure out what productivity is really about. Uh, when clients ask, how will I know if they're working? Uh, you have this concept called presenteeism. How do you know if they're working now? Uh, and... Uh, This is uh, something that uh, management experts have been trying to tackle for a long, long time. Uh, uh, Somehow we're gonna have to get a handle on what are real results. And we're going to have to trust people uh, and we're going to have to gain their trust. One of the ways of gaining their trust, uh, for example, in virtual meetings, is not making it all business. Let's spend a little time before the meeting of being somewhat personal, caring about people. And we did a little bit of this when we started this webinar. We chatted a little um, about personal things. Now that goes a very long way in terms of building trust because a person doesn't feel like a commodity. They realize they're appreciated as a person. In fact, some of these Zoom meetings have been interesting. Uh, When uh, somebody's kid comes across the backyard and the person is quite well known, we're all delighted that they seem so much more real and we trust them uh, so much more. Uh, The other issue that we're going to have to deal with is the issue of safety. While health authorities are reopening some of us don't want to come back to work. We may be physically safety and we can put in those, um, uh, we can put in some of these procedures so that we're physically safety, social distancing, for example, um, 
we can, uh, lots of washing of your hands, uh, whatever it takes, washing down washrooms. But some people, and people vary so tremendously on psychological risk, and they aren't going to want to come back. They don't want to be in an unventilated uh, area, an open office. Uh, and um, some people are just not going to want to come back. And my hope is that if you feel uncomfortable coming back, that you have the ability not to feel ashamed and to express what's troubling you. Uh, so I think that uh, while commuting is such a great thing, uh, it's a huge factor in not wanting to come back uh, and people are getting so much more for their real estate. Uh, another issue is going to be how safe do we really feel? Uh, and some people are just not going to feel safe and we're going to have to respect that. Uh, Eva, uh, returning to work now is going to be, when, when we return to work, it's going to be a new normal. And, sort of, and, yeah. Uh, now I'm looking at the time and I would like to get your thoughts on um, what can we do? What can I do? to prepare myself for the new normal. How can I psychologically feel good about the new arrangement and you know, build some kind of a psychological fortitude, resilience as you may call it? What can we do to right, prepare okay. ourselves so, for the new normal? Yeah, I think we'll cut out the poll that we had in mind just because I can see yeah. time has is going on. That's why I'm moving. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. So what, seem to be a sprint is now an ultra marathon and uh for myself i can't believe how time is moving so much more quickly it's the middle of june and i think it has to be because my my activity is going from the bedroom to the kitchen to the garden and i'm not going anywhere uh the other thing is uh, the new normal there's a lot of fear in the air and there are legitimate reasons to be worried. We're, we're worried about the future of our jobs. We're worried if we're gonna get sick. We're worried about the financial market. And uh, I know going into Costco makes me anxious. Here, I brought a little mask just to show you how little empathy we have when we wear a mask. Uh, the other thing that is happening is uh, the new normal isn't actually all that more normal because we're not getting together with friends and we all are yearning for touch. Uh, I was chatting with a colleague of mine in Sydney and he saw several elderly people just grabbing dogs. They wanted to grab a dog just to be able to hug them. And uh, this may or may not surprise you, but dogs are in huge supply, a uh, huge uh, shortage rather. It's not toilet paper, it's dogs. Uh, and some of this stress is very cumulative and it's all stored in the amygdala, the part of the brain that reacts to fear and initiates a fight or flight response. So what can we do? That, that was your question. How can we become resilient? How can we recover from setbacks, adapt well to change, and keep going? Now, there's a few routines and skills that we can do. Uh, one of these is going to surprise you, and that is getting up about the same time every morning and making your bed. First thing, uh, Navy SEAL Admiral, Admiral William McRaven, gave an inspiring commencement speech, and he said, if you want to change the world, make your bed. Seems so simple. Uh, and uh, I do it every day. Get out of your pajamas. While it's true that many people will not see you, it will make you feel better. Uh, the second thing is compartmentalize your life. Separate work from leisure. Uh, this is very important. We have a professor at McMaster, and what she does when she begins her work day is she takes a walk in her driveway, walks along the driveway, comes back, goes into her office. When it's the end of the day, 
She walks along the driveway, back to her, uh, along the driveway, and she comes through the front door, and that's the end of her work day. So uh, I think that's a very powerful thing that you can do. And take detachment breaks. Uh, many people feel that if they take five, 10 minutes in the midst of working, they're wasting time. Uh, in fact, we can concentrate only about 90 to 120 minutes a day. It's about efficient energy use. Like one of the things I do is I've been working 90, 120 minutes. I may take a uh, walk around, uh, take, a, uh, take a break, my Fitbit, feed my Fitbit a little bit. And maybe even um, I, might, uh, I might fold the laundry. Uh, and then exercise, exercise. Exercise is so essential. There is so much research that shows the mental health benefits of moving your muscles. If you've ever gone uh, for a walk or run, or done some exercise after a stressful day, you know how much it makes you, how much better it makes you feel. The link between exercise and mood is very, very strong. And physical activity uh, is not just short term, but long term. As um, in my career as a psychologist working with depressed people, Depressed people on an exercise program get as much benefit as going on antidepressants. And that's pretty powerful. Um, what else can we see? Um, greenery and parks. The research is compelling there too. Walking on a street in a city is not going to be as wonderful for you as walking in a park and uh, seeing trees. The Japanese aren't crazy when they talk about hugging your tree. It actually is very good for your mental health. Uh, and finally, and there's a whole bunch of studies which I can't quote right now because I can see we're running out of time. Uh, and I will mention the last one, which is mindfulness. Now, mindfulness is not something that I particularly do but the research is so compelling that mindfulness changes your brain chemistry. And there's tons of free programs online. There's Headspace that lets you do it. I know my husband Leonard uses it. And uh, it's just a very, very useful uh, tool if it sings to you. Now, uh, just before a word of caution, we are such a type A society that some of these suggestions I'm giving you may turn self-care into self-criticism, right? So all of a sudden, we're already stressed out and we haven't done our 10,000 steps. Oh my God, we have something else to, to worry about. We haven't done our mindfulness. So I caution to you to use it uh, in terms of self-care and having some compassion for yourself. How are we doing for time here? Maybe I better, uh, I was going to talk a little bit about agility, but I can see we want to have time for questions. I think. Um, yeah, so I'll just leave it here. These are wise words, Eva, and uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing your wisdom with us. And um, you know, my takeaway is from all of this, I'm thinking in terms of cliches uh, that necessity is the mother of invention and let's make hay when the sun shines. Right. And, uh, so, um, so what I would like to do is to see whether we have some questions from our audience and uh, we'll be able to respond to the questions. The way I like to go about is to, is to is to collate the questions or collect the questions or club them together right. so that one response will answer five or six questions. Okay. okay. And um, so let's take a look at uh, the questions that we may have from our audience. Hmm. Okay. Uh, you go to Q&A &A and uh, you see. Um, oh, should I go to Q&A? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you can take a look at them and, yeah. uh, and respond to those questions. 
Yes. Okay. I'd like to, I'd like to say something to Brendan, uh, because I think it is important that teams do bond. If you can possibly have your team meet uh, face to face, it's going to be incredibly powerful. We had a knowledge lab with Adam Fileski that some of you may have been on, and he said he wouldn't do a deal he didn't think with uh, a person and a company that he had not met face to face. He just wouldn't feel he could trust them. So if at all you can do that, I think that's a great idea. Same with a brand new employee that you hire. Uh, you may wanna just send them working virtually. I don't think that's a good idea. I think you should bring them into the office for a little while so that they learn the culture and that you can train them properly. So if you have that luxury, please take it. Uh, there is uh, another question on, on career. How do you, how does one manage one's career uh, uh, in from home working? You know, there are uncertainties or anxieties about uh, career progression. And, um, but, do you see the question? Uh, yes, I do, and I get, I get, the, I get the point. I get the point because people have asked me about that. Uh, they worry that because they're not in the office, uh, their career progression is going to evaporate. I think it's still just important to still count what you do, count your accomplishments, get in touch with some of the people in one to ones, communicate just because you're not called upon to communicate and be in meetings, make sure that you are still networking with people. Mm -hmm. It's a bit different. It's definitely a bit different, but networking is not impossible virtually. Um, and there's lots of things on the internet that teach you how to do that. Um, I think that that's a, that's a very important thing because of course you want, and you can ask that question, how am I doing? How do you see me? Feedback doesn't go away. Performance appraisal doesn't go away. Uh, it's maybe a little more awkward to do it virtually, uh, but uh, it still can be done and it can be done very effectively. Now, and, uh, let's see. There is a question from Tiffany about has anyone started a new job? My niece had started a new job um, with the pandemic. And uh, this is a good question because I'm dealing with it because I'm talking to her about, she's asking me the same question. And what she is doing is she is telling her employer that I need some social socialization time. Uh, we don't want to talk about work, but I want to talk to my colleagues about my life and their life and their dog and my cat and so on. Okay. So let's carve out some time to get to know each other more socially and so on. Make this process more interesting. Otherwise, you know, you would go to the office, you'll have a coffee. So she wants right. to create a virtual coffee time. That's and and, and there should be a good manager has some social time. Uh, you can start a meeting and say, hey, hey, Baba, what interesting movies have you seen on Netflix? Uh -huh. What's the game? I actually started a, um, I started a website early on called coronavirus-humor.com. And so I was sharing jokes with people. And that was a great bonding social thing at work. And people love sharing them. So there are lots of things that you can do. Uh, to be social, it's just a little different than what we're used to. Anonymous. Now, there is a question about, um, you know, how one feel, deals with, you know, being de-energized, unfocused, or caught in a negative um, cycle of procrastination and so on. You know, I mean, we all go through this. We're all going, and I think as this is lasting, we are into a marathon and in the beginning, all of, many of us were so excited. Oh, this was a great holiday. We could do all the things we didn't want to do. But as this is lasting, we are feeling de-energized. Uh, now, what can we do about it? Well, I've already told you I'm a big proponent of exercise. Uh, take a walk in the park every day. Uh, it's, you'll be surprised how it's going to replenish you. Uh, the other thing is 
uh, you may be disappointed in yourself. You may have had this great scheme of how productive you're going, you, you're going to be. Give yourself a break. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're not accountable, but don't be so hard on yourself. Uh, give yourself a little bit of compassion uh, that this is a tough time. We're all struggling. Even the people that are doing great are still struggling. They are feeling, they wish it was back to the way it was. And um, I think that starting to do just a little bit, uh, not a magical, uh, a magical turnaround, but uh, just a walk in the park every day. And uh, I promise you, your mood is going to be a little bit better. Eva, there is another question about the ideal balance. We talked about um, returning to work partially. That mm -hmm. means three days plus two days, four days and one day. There is a question about that. What are your thoughts on that? Eva? Well, many, many years ago, I was asked when I was living in London, I was asked to give a talk about work-life balance. And I remember the CEO was horrified about how I was going to talk about that because he thought half his workforce is going to work 50% less hard. And in fact, I did just the opposite. I said there is no ideal work-life balance. Uh, it just doesn't exist. Some people are happier when they're working more. Uh, other people really need to have... Uh, an eight hour work day, and then they need their leisure. Uh, the important thing in terms of work-life balance is to feel that you're in control of your agenda. It's when you're not in control that uh, you start feeling the stress. If your spouse says to you, I want you spending more time with your kid, but you're working, uh, that stresses you out. It may look in terms of hours that your work-life balance is, is better, but actually your stress level is higher because you're not where you want to be. So the issue is really control, having control of your agenda. Um, and, and it's thank true, you, Eva. Um, I yes, think uh, clock, we, so. much as we would like to have um, more time to engage uh, with the audience on the question and answer, uh, we just have to respect the time that they have given us. And so I'd like to invite Dean Weberman to yeah. come in and- uh, Yeah, I just want to make one comment, uh, one comment. I'm going to put perhaps on uh, as a takeaway, some of these uh, things that we have talked about, things you can do for self-care uh, and uh, with some references as well, so that you can look at them at your leisure because we haven't gone into them quite as much as I would like. In fact, we could have had the whole webinar just on self-care, couldn't we have? So I wanted to thank uh, Father and Eva for what they did. You can see how lucky I am uh, uh, as a human being. I have faculty like Baba and I have a wife like Eva. So uh, uh, we hope you all enjoyed today's webinar. Keep an eye <laughs> on our website for future webinars. Uh, and everybody take care. I think there are a lot of profound uh, uh, thoughts today, and uh, I think we will all take them on and understand uh, life work balance is personal. And I think, Avery, you're right. Uh, we just have to allow people to do it the, the way they need to. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the week. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Bubba. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you.